Hello, good evening. I can't tell you how nice it is to see you all here in person. My name is Charlotte Gilbride, and I am the coordinator of the Nancy R. Chandler Lecture Series of CSCC Foundation. To start, I would like to share CSCC's land acknowledgement. CSCC would like to acknowledge that the beautiful land our campuses reside on are the original homelands of the Waskow and the Warm Springs people. They ceded this land to the U.S. government in the Treaty of 1855. The Paiute people were forcefully moved to the Warm Springs Indian Reservation starting in 1879. It is also important to note that the Klamath Trail ran north through this region to the Great Salilo Falls Trading Grounds and the Klamath tribes claim it as their own. Descendants of these original people are thriving members of our community today. We acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land. Thank you. Again, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, again, we have our in-person audience welcome, and welcome to our Zoom audience as well. The things we've learned how to do during this pandemic, right? Um, this is the first time we've actually done live and a live stream. So be patient with us and let us know if there's an issue. I've got lots of people on my team doing great work. So welcome to all of you. This is also our first season under our updated name. Our program's name is now Nancy R. Chandler Lecture Series. We thought that name, we changed it this fall to better align with our format and our offerings. It may not seem like a big deal, but when you've been around since 1985, a name change is kind of exciting. So there, there you have it. Tonight's program is made possible by the Chandler Lecture Series annual sponsors. They are the Associated Students of COCC and Maybell Clark McDonald Fund. Without their continued support throughout the academic year, we couldn't do what we do for our students and our community. So thank you so much to those two organizations. And one last housekeeping thing, at the end of Hal's presentation, we have reserved time for a Q&A with all of our audiences, both in person and live stream. So in person, you'll just simply raise your hand and we will call on you. And the, for our live stream audience, the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen is disabled, but the Q&A function works, and that is where you submit your questions. You're able to like or, or upvote a question if you see a question that you would like answered. You're also able to comment on a question if you'd like to make an addition to a question that's been submitted. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible, as I'm sure there'll be questions. And now I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speaker. Hal Warshow began his geology career with research projects in Peru and Hawaii before settling at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he monitored groundwater for high explosives and radioactivity and took school children on backyard geology field trips on his off days. After realizing that he made more meaningful impact by sharing his stoke for all things Earth, he decided to teach. Thank goodness. Along the way, he studied glaciers and climate change at Western Washington University, and he had the good fortune to find himself surrounded by teaching mentors. Since beginning at COCC in 2018, Hal has become enamored with our fabulous local volcanoes and the glaciers they host. He is passionate about using a geologic lens to look at anthropogenic changes in the Earth system, and that's why we're here today. He, Hal has spent a ton of time and research on this talk. We are in for a huge treat. So please join me in welcoming Hal Warshaw. All righty. Thank you folks so much. Um, this is kind of crazy being up here without a mask on. We did check with the state. This is cool. If you folks in the front row would be happier a, a row back, that's totally fine. I won't be offended. <laughs> no, sorry. All right, so with that being said, let's get to where we're going. This is going to be a bit of a roller coaster. Um, let's start with a little personal vignette here. So this is a photo I took on September 8th, 2021 from the Science Center where I work. 
And as you can see, there was pretty horrendous wildfires that day, that week. Couldn't see anything. Couldn't even see the other side of town. And the reason I'm showing this image, this is one way of looking at climate change and it's accurate and it's also super depressing. Um, my goal is not to depress everybody today. Instead, I want to suggest that we can adopt this sort of a mentality and look at the things that we can do. Be hopeful, be empowered. Both are real, both are accurate. I'm going to try to focus on this. There will be some of this. It's part of the story too. So with that being said, let's launch into this. So Charlotte's already given us a land acknowledgement, which I really appreciated. Uh, the point of a land acknowledgement, as I understand it, is to give voice to folks who have not had a public voice in the past. made uh, by folks at the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs about how they're dealing with climate change. Um, this is a lady named Tamara Calhoun, and I'm going to let her speak to us for about a minute. When I was stationed in Germany 20 years ago, they were talking about changes in the forest and the environment. I really didn't understand the impact that had. Now I work in the heating and ventilation field. It's always been hot here in the summertime. But last year, it seems like instead of being real hot, it was scorching hot. There were 38 straight days of 100 degree plus weather. And the highest recorded temperature last summer was 119 degrees. The air was stagnant and we could barely breathe. I had more calls to buildings because the heat pumps and the cooling towers can only operate for so long in extreme conditions before you have to start maintaining them. I had to add water on them to keep them cool. I also had more calls for AC, getting up and running, than all the previous years. Our priority is elders in the summertime to make sure they stay cool and stay alive. Thank you, Tamara. So, with that being said, let's get into this. Summer 2021, kind of sucked. There was horrendous wildfires. We had tremendous drought. That's waking up reservoir running dry. The question I think a lot of us are asking ourselves is, is this the new normal? Is this what we get to live with for the rest of our lives? I will answer that question during this talk. Before we jump into that though, I wanna think about this from a different perspective. So, another personal story. During that horrendous heat wave in late June, when we saw record-breaking temperatures throughout Cascadia, all of these dark, dark reds, temperatures 35 degrees more than the normal. We set all-time records pretty much everywhere. What was that experience like for me? Well, I've got air conditioning in my house, so I closed the windows and turned on the air conditioning. If I wanted to go somewhere, I got in a car with air conditioning. At work, my office had air conditioning. That heat wave was a major nuisance. That's not true for a lot of people. This is the average death count in Oregon week by week. You can see we were hovering around 800 in the early summer. As we hit that heat wave, late, late June, early July, we saw a peak of somewhere between 150 and 200 extra people dying. We know that at least 116 of those were directly related to the heat wave, just in the state of Oregon. That's not counting Washington and British Columbia where hundreds more people died. The point I wanna make here, anytime we're talking about climate change, it does not affect us all equally. My life is inconvenienced by climate change. There are people in this town who died because of climate change. So, this is a headline from June 28th, in the peak of the heat wave. Two men who lived in the Hunnell Road encampment died because they did not have access to any way to cool off. I want to juxtapose that with, again, what some of us experience when we talk about these hot days. This is also real. This is wonderful. The fact that we have this resource of a cold river that goes through the middle of town that we all have access to, that's amazing. I love that. I'm so glad people were able to cool off that day. But we need to remember that that is just as true as this reality. As we're talking about climate change then, we need to think about climate equity as well. Sorry, as we're talking about climate resilience, we need to talk about climate equity. So let me give you an idea of where we're going with this talk, a little bit of an outline. I'm going to talk briefly about how our climate has already changed and how it is projected to change. This is the stuff I'm an expert on that I'm comfortable with, that the science is very well settled on, and I'm going to gloss over it. If you got more questions about it, ask me at the end. What I want to focus on is this idea of climate resilience. 
basically, what can I do on a personal level to make our community more climate resilient? What is our community doing? What could our community be doing? This is where the roller coasters get start. I've got some interesting ideas here. You might like them, you might hate them, we'll see. Uh, but I wanna get this conversation going about climate resilience in our community. And I'll wrap it up with a little geologist take on this all. As Charlotte mentioned, I do try to apply a geologic lens to these things because it's a little different than the way normal people think. Uh, and then as far as the Q&A goes, I wanna emphasize I am not an expert on climate resilience. I have talked to countless experts in their subfields over the last month and learned so much. And there's no way I'm gonna be able to share every story or answer every question. So please share stories and ask questions when we get to the end. Yeah. All right, so let's launch into this thing. All right, so late September, I was looking out at the Collier Glacier. As a geologist, this is the most obvious jaw-dropping evidence that our climate has already changed. A hundred years ago, in 1921, the Collier Glacier, this is Middle Sister and North Sister, by the way, we're looking south. The Collier Glacier, which today ends right about here, came all the way down here, was up against these piles of dirt called moraines, wrapped around here, completely filled this basin, and wrapped back up this way. It was enormous. That was just a hundred years ago. Climate's been changing for a while here. What else has happened? Well, we've had 2.75 degrees of warming since 1895. We've had more heat waves. We've had less snowpack. And that snowpack, not only is there less of it, but it's melting out earlier. The droughts have gotten worse. In fact, the droughts of the last 20 years, compared to the, a record, a paleoclimate record that goes back over 1,200 years, this is as bad as it's been for the last 1,200 years. It's a big time period. And the fires, of course, have gotten worse too. That one's a little more complicated. That, does, that is also related to how we manage our forests. But the droughts make fire worse. They dry out the vegetation and create these horrendous fires we're seeing. All right, so that's kind of depressing. Let's talk about how much hotter it's going to get. So looking at this graph, x-axis shows us time going back to about 1900. Notice it projects into the future. To 2100. Everything in gray here is the historical record. This is what the average temperature has been doing, slowly increasing with cooler than average years and warmer than average years. And note the last 20 or 30 years have been significantly warmer than average. That's global warming. Specifically, I should say that's warming in the state of Oregon. That's what this data applies to. Now let's talk about the future. We've got two different emission scenarios. Basically, will humanity do business as usual, keep on emitting tons and tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? That's RCP 8.5. That's the red line. You can see it starts to diverge, and by the end of the century, we're seeing somewhere around nine degrees Fahrenheit of warming from baseline. Instead, if humanity gets its act together and does RCP 4.5, that's in line with what the Paris Accords were trying to do, um, that's significant carbon dioxide emissions from every nation on this planet. We still have global warming. It's still getting hotter. But by mid-century, we're starting to see a big divergence, and it's actually leveling out by the end of the century. So this is a world humanity can deal with. Not easy, but much more doable. What I want to do now is look a little more closely at Central Oregon and how some of these effects are being, we project they will be felt here. These are complicated graphs. I'm gonna acknowledge that right now. Um, what I wanna emphasize, I made these. You can make them too. There's a sweet thing called Climate Toolbox. You can mess around, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can move all around and mess around with it. So you guys are gonna get access to these slides afterwards with direct links to these maps. You can mess around to your heart's content. This is what I do for fun. Um, <laughs> To orient you on this map, there's Portland, there's the border, that's the Columbia, here's the Deschutes River, here's Bend, there's Redmond. Um, and what we're actually looking at, we're comparing the two different scenarios. We're going to look at the higher emission scenario, RCP 8.5, and looking at mid-century, like 2040, 2069, and then comparing that to the historical simulation, meaning basically what was normal, 1971 to 2000. So what this is showing us is days where we've got a heat index greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. In other words, a heat wave. That's deadly heat. 
the really simple take home point here, if we do nothing, we get another three weeks of heat waves of those horrendously hot days. Depends exactly where you are, but on average in central Oregon, we're looking at about three more weeks by mid-century. If we do something, if we reduce those emissions, it's still kind of bad. Um, two more weeks of heat waves, not as bad, still significant. That's going to be the theme here. So if we're talking about snowpack, this one's a little hard to read. Um, focus on our mountains right here and notice as we go from Mount Bachelor, which is right there towards Bend, those colors get browner and browner and browner. That's meaning we're losing more and more and more of our snowpack. Specifically, it's looking at something called snow water equivalent, which is basically how much water is in the snowpack. And the projection is for April 1st, which is more or less when we hit peak snowpack each year. Uh, so one way of trying to wrap your heads around this, we're expecting to see a decrease about 30% of the, of the snow water equivalent at Mount Bachelor um, by mid-century and a 70% decrease at Virginia Meisner Snow Park. Remember, this is average. That means some years are going to be better. We're still going to have some good years, but a lot of years are also going to be worse, which means some years we won't basically get anything. Besides snow play, which is cool, um, that snowpack is our source of water during the summer. Everyone needs that, whether you're irrigating water or you're a fish or a frog or a rafter or a fisher person, whoever you are, you use our rivers and they rely on that, on that winter snowpack to melt out late in the spring and supply us with water in the summer. So that's the real significance of this. If we reduce emissions, it's not quite as bad. 20% decrease at Mount Bachelor, 60% decrease at Virginia Meisner Snow Park, a little more water available in our streams and creeks by the end of the summer. That can make a difference for a lot of organisms. Let's look at drought. Drought's a hard one to measure, so we've got to kind of come up with proxy measurements. This one is known as potential evapotranspiration from grasslands. It's basically measuring how much water would the air suck out of the ground and out of the plants. Think of it as the demand for water from the atmosphere. So if we do nothing, we're going to see a tremendous increase in the demand for water in our atmosphere during the summer. That's what the red colors mean. But remember what we just said, we're losing water supply. We're going to have less water available during the summer because we're losing our snowpack. So look at the situation that we're creating here. Increase in demand, decrease in supply. That's a drought. What we can expect is the droughts that we've already been seeing are going to get significantly worse. If we do something, there's not quite as much extra demand. There's not quite as much of a diminishment of supply. And we still get droughts, but they're not quite as bad. Similar story, not quite as bad. Easier to deal with. Let's talk about fire danger. In this case, we're measuring something, or we're projecting something called 100 hour fuel moisture below the third percentile. Basically, it's how much moisture is in the vegetation. Dry vegetation burns fast. Wet vegetation resists burning. With the do-nothing scenario, we can expect seven to 10 more extreme fire risk days. Those are days where if there is a spark on the landscape, everything goes up in flames. If we do something, only five to seven more. Still bad, not as bad. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna try to emphasize that choice. That is a choice and it does make a difference. So that's kind of the depressing part. Take a moment. Grieve for what we have lost, for what we have already lost, for those who have already suffered. This is real and it has been happening. Let's move forward and talk about what we can do. I'm going to throw out some suggestions. So, one possibility is we can do nothing. We can do business as usual. I've got air conditioning and a sprinkler and then my food comes from the grocery store. I'm fine. Or perhaps you're really into mitigation, meaning reducing carbon emissions any way we can, like I just showed, for those effects. All that matters is reducing warming. Or maybe you're like, adaptation's a thing. Warming is inevitable. People should move to more hospitable places. Okay, I'm not very good at uh, hiding things, so let's talk about the fourth option. We can reduce carbon emissions, that's mitigation, while increasing the ability of vulnerable people to thrive in a hotter world. That's adaptation. I want to make an argument for why 
this is the route we should take. All right, the air conditioner and the tree. This is a great story. So, as I mentioned earlier, the air conditioner made that heat wave pretty nice for me. Here's the problem. That air conditioner was putting out greenhouse gas emissions because the electricity that was running it was dirty coal-powered electricity. So, it was not mitigating, it was doing the opposite. Furthermore, the heat that was coming out of that air conditioner as it cooled the inside of my house was heating up the atmosphere around me. This is a major contributor to something called the urban heat island effect, which we're going to talk more about. So I was basically making my neighbors hotter if they didn't have AC. Furthermore, not everybody can afford these. In the state of Oregon, about 68% of single family homes have air conditioners. Only 25% of multifamily residences, which tend to be lower income people, can afford air conditioners. There's a lot of people that this is not an option for. In contrast, we can plant trees. Trees pull carbon out of the atmosphere. That's so cool. They mitigate. That's great. They also shade our cities, shade our streets, shade our people and cool things down. They reduce the urban heat island effect. And they're for everybody. Anyone can sit under the shade of that tree. Doesn't matter who you are. So the point I want to make here is this is the sort of solution that we should be embracing. Every plan and every action should be reducing carbon in the atmosphere and increasing the ability of vulnerable people to thrive in a hot world. I really want to emphasize this. I don't need help to deal with climate change. I'm in good shape. There's a lot of us who are not. That's where we need to be focusing our efforts. All right, so we're on board. We're going to mitigate and adapt with equity. Sweet, great. Let's go forward here. All right, climate resilience on a personal level. Time to shake things up, get you guys engaged, get optimistic. Take a moment, think about what you have done in your own life to reduce your carbon footprint. I guarantee you there's at least one thing, maybe many. Now, after you've had that moment to think about it, share your favorite action that you've taken with whomever is seated nearest to you that you don't know. I want you to meet somebody new. If you're on Zoom, I can't do that. But anyways, go for it. Chat with each other. Take a minute. Alrighty, folks. Sounds like people got a lot to share there. That's awesome. I'm super stoked that people are already doing cool things to reduce their carbon footprint. That's terrific. Um, this is another video. I'm not going to play it, um, but it's a story by a member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, a lady named Carlin Yalla, and she's also been doing some cool things to reduce her carbon footprint. So, as I mentioned, you all have access to these slides. You'll get an email at the end. You can play this video and learn a little bit more there. In the interest of time, I'm not going to play. Let's move on. All right, this is the classic, what can you do to reduce your carbon footprint? I am not going to spend very much time on this. You could spend lots of time on it. There's a few problems. Number one, nobody wants to do the top three. How many people here want to have less kids? That's a hard one to talk people into. Um, but there's a more important reason. From a statistical perspective, your carbon footprint is not going to change the world. You can have lots of kids, you can have no kids. Either way, global warming is happening. That's really frustrating to hear. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do these things. Every bit of carbon does count. It is cumulative. If everybody does it, it will work. But focusing just on what you are doing in your own life is a limited impact. So I wanna give you a little thought experiment to illustrate this point. All right, we got two solar setups here. They're the exact same size solar systems. The question is which one's gonna make a bigger impact in terms of reducing carbon emissions on planet Earth? Things to think about here. This is the front of the house facing the road. This is the back of the house facing the backyard. This is the front of the house facing the road. Here's the back of the house facing the backyard. We're social creatures. Every day, people are going to walk by this house and see those solar panels and be like, oh yeah, cool, solar, maybe I should do that. Every day, people are gonna drive past there and be like, man, those solar panels are pretty spiffy. Wish I had those in my house. It's true, there's science to back this up. There are tons of studies of how and why people do things like put solar panels on their roofs, and they all more or less find the same thing. We are influenced by those around us. This is limited. All it's ever going to do is produce a little bit of electricity that won't be from coal. 
This is unlimited. This is going to inspire others who are going to inspire others who are going to inspire others. The ripple effect. Point I want to make here, folks, be loud, be proud. <laughs> Share what you're doing. What you just did is exactly what I want y'all to do. You don't need to be self-righteous about it, but have fun and share with, your, with everyone. All right, so let's transition to the community level. I want to keep the optimism rolling. You guys are get to, going to get to talk again. On a community level, what are you involved in that is striving to reduce carbon emissions and or helping vulnerable people thrive in a warming world? If you don't immediately have something that you're involved in, Maybe you've heard of a story that you can share. Same deal, share with your neighbors. We're gonna try to do some sound work while you guys do that. Alrighty folks, let's check back in here. Thank you again for sharing all these stories. That is really my goal tonight, is for us to learn about what is happening in our community that we can be excited about. Remember, a little bit of blue sky thinking. So thank you for sharing those stories. What I'm gonna do now is share some of the stories I have learned. They are not exhaustive, they're not comprehensive. There are a lot of stories I have not learned. So again, this is a great opportunity during the Q&A, you can share some stories. Um, so I'm gonna share a few of the ones that I'm really excited about. All right, let's talk about something called watershed restoration. I'm a geologist, I like these terms. What it really means is restoring rivers, fixing rivers that we have messed up because we're humans and we like messing with things. So what that means specifically is reconnecting streams to floodplains. So instead of them being channelized, allowing them to flood again and create more riparian vegetation. Riparian is a fancy word that means plants that need water. So these are the plants that grow by rivers, cattails, willows, that sort of thing. So watershed restoration, if we do those two things right there, guess what happens? The water on the landscape slows down. Instead of shooting through and emptying out into the Columbia sooner than we've had a chance to use it, it sticks around. It's kind of the same as the snowpack. It releases the water slowly so that in August and September, there's still water in our streams and in our creeks. So this is happening all over Central Oregon. There are more organizations than I can name that are involved in this. I'm gonna tell one story that I never heard before. Uh, this is happening at Mill Creek. Mill Creek is a tributary to the Warm Springs River. Back in the 60s, there was a mill pond and basically that was for logging purposes. These are all trees or timber. And you can see that the river itself, or Mill Creek I should say, was turned into just like a little irrigation ditch. This is what I mean when I say channelized. There's no ability for the river to do its thing. It's just stuck right there. So by 2011, the situation had improved a little bit. Uh, the mill ponds were gone and those big earthen berms that were holding them in have been breached. So Mill Creek at least is flowing through again, but it's still fairly limited. A geologist would say this is a fairly straight stretch. It doesn't have a lot of sinuosity. Um, and the riparian vegetation is more or less limited to the river banks. The Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, with some help from the Bonneville Power Administration, did a restoration effort, I believe in 2015, and this is the result. So that white line, was the, the river's, the creek's course in 2011. And notice how things have changed. Right here, we have spread out into this basin and created a whole bunch more riparian vegetation. As we follow the creek along, we see it's taking a new path, a longer path, a wider path. It's slowing down. And again, more riparian vegetation all around here. This is what watershed restoration looks like. All right, let's give a round of applause. Good. Good blood moving, be happy. People are doing good things in Central Oregon. That's for all the watershed restoration that's happening, not just at Mill Creek. Wychus Creek's another great example. What else is going on? Let's talk about water conservation. So the vast majority of water in Central Oregon is used for irrigation. I think some stats I remember, 660,000 acre feet of water a year for irrigation, 12,000 acre feet of water for the city of Bend. So do you bend? Irrigation. Yeah, exactly, wow. So this is how it moves in these irrigation canals. They're unlined, water is evaporating all the time. Water is also seeping into the incredibly uh, fractured uh, lava rocks below. Depending on who you ask, the estimates are anywhere from 30 to 50% of this water gets lost 
before it's used either for irrigation or heads back into the river. So there's been a major initiative to pipe the canals. Uh, it's expensive, takes a lot of work, but the goal is that now we don't lose any water and not only do we have more irrigation water available for farmers, we don't need to pull as much out of the Deschutes in the first place, meaning there's more water in the Deschutes for the fish and the frogs and everybody who likes to use the river. This is good stuff. Um, I think we can do another round of applause. Yeah. The Deschutes River is flowing more today than it has in the past because of efforts like this. Cool. So let's talk about equity again. Where's this water going? Who gets it? This gets complicated. I'm going to hit the tip of the iceberg here. It's all about water rights. Basically, about 100 years ago, we started making laws about who gets what water and who has the rights to it. And there are senior water rights holders who get the first dibs, and there are junior water rights holders who get whatever is left. In our situation right now, there's farmers in Jefferson County who are part of what's known as the North Unit Irrigation District. They are the junior water rights holders. They're the first ones who get cut off when Wikiup Reservoir runs dry. Central Oregon Irrigation District in Deschutes County still gets water. This is the problem, folks. These people um, are going bankrupt. They're not able to irrigate their fields. So last summer, there was uh, an attempt at legislation to fix some of these problems, and a farmer in the North Unit Irrigation District named Kate Havstead Kassad gave some testimony to the state legislature. She said, what is happening through the forced dry up of this district because we are junior water rights holders is a massive ecological and a social disaster that not many people truly understand is happening. She likened it to dust bowl conditions. She went on to say, we watch it happen. We stand in the middle of it. It's like watching your children's future blow away. Kate was a relatively new farmer on the scene. There are seventh generation farmers in Jefferson County who are going bankrupt because of this situation. So even as we congratulate ourselves for preserving more water, we still need to do more and make sure this water gets to the people who need it. All right, let's shake it up again and get positive. First foods, what are those? So traditional foods that have been used by native peoples on this landscape for thousands of years. They're incredibly important, not only to the physical health of the people who eat them, but also the spiritual health. It's a way to connect with one's landscape. There's another great video here that I'm not going to show, but I encourage you guys to look at later um, by a fellow named Neil Morning Owl about how his family uses first foods. What's been going on that's pretty cool is something called the East Cascades Oak Partnership. I didn't even know we had oak woodlands in the East Cascades. They're rare and they're threatened by climate change, no surprise, but there are groups that are working to restore them. One of the primary reasons is that they're amazing places for first foods. Foods like balsam root, desert parsley, bitter root, sorry, balsam leaf, um, acorn, lots of foods that are important for folks who've been in this area for thousands of years and are in danger of losing access to those foods. So, a lot of people involved with that one. Let's give them a round of applause for conserving our woodlands. Yeah, all right, cool. Hopefully it's keeping you guys engaged and awake. I'm not falling asleep. <laughs> All right, let's talk about what's happening in the city of Bend. We got this thing called the Community Climate Action Plan. What's that about? Well, the city of Bend is intending to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 40% below 2016 levels by 2030. That's cool. That's mitigation. And a further 70% below those 2016 levels by 2050. Great. Let me give you guys a concrete example of how they're doing this. <clears throat> Um, Hooker Creek, who is a local concrete construction company, uh, has been producing a low carbon concrete. Why is this important, low carbon concrete? I'll tell you why, because 8% of global CO2 emissions come from concrete. That's crazy. That's more than any country in the world except for the US or China. So yeah, this is part of the solution. And the city of Bend has a contract with Hooker Creek to make sidewalk pavement, sidewalk concrete, that's lower, that has about 30% lower carbon emissions. Cool, that's action, that's happening. All right, what else is going on? So the city of Bend is advised on these decisions by the Environment and Climate Change Committee. That committee recently met and prioritized their top six recommendations for what the city of Bend should be doing 
to meet these goals. In no particular order, I'm going to share two of those recommendations because I think they line up nicely with some of the other things we're talking about here. Number one there is the 100% renewable energy. As you guys are going to see, our energy is not very clean in bed. We need to change that. We also need to be thinking again about equity. So solar, it's awesome. It saves you money. Every, every, every electricity bill goes lower if you have solar. But a lot of people can't afford the upfront cost, up front cost to get those solar panels in the first place. So the idea here is creating a fund that has loans for folks who don't have the money to pay for the solar initially so that they can reap those benefits. Again, this is mitigation with adaptation to help vulnerable people. Great, City of Bend's doing some cool things. I'm very stoked about that. It is important that we keep the pressure on. These are all intentions. There's nothing that legally obligates it. So that's where our role as citizens comes in. Anyways, let's move on here. I was talking earlier about how we don't have very clean electricity. What this uh, chart is showing us is basically how dirty the electricity is that is produced by the major utilities in the state of Oregon. Pacific Power is first. It's the dirtiest. We don't applaud that. Uh, we're seeing about 1.5 pounds of carbon dioxide emitted per kilowatt hour. Portland General Electric significantly below that. Idaho Power Company is way below that. All of our consumer-owned cooperatives, like the Central Oregon Electrical Cooperative, almost nothing. We got a problem here, folks. The reason, no surprise, is coal. So, Pacific Power sending about 56.57% of the electricity that we receive in Bend is coal powered from places in Utah and Wyoming. What's frustrating to me here is they're doing literally the bare minimum that they're legally obligated to do. They are obligated to have a 15% renewable portfolio. They're delivering 14.97%, which I believe rounds up to 15. So what are, what are we gonna do about this? It's worth mentioning in their defense that they do have a few programs where individuals can opt for cleaner energy by paying more for it. It's called the Blue Sky Program. It's a step in the right direction. There's also a community solar program that you can subscribe to. And this is basically a way to purchase solar energy without having to go to the expense of installing it on your own roof. It's basically funding new solar installations like industrial scale solar installations. So steps in the right direction. Let's talk about this on a state level. We need more carbon neutral electricity. Some good things have been happening. 2016, the Oregon legislature passed the Clean Energy and Coal Transition Act. This obligated every Oregon utility, including Pacific Power, to eliminate coal powered electricity by 2030. That's awesome. That 56% whatever is gonna be zero by 2030. That's still nine years down the line. That's not soon enough. 2020, there's an executive order, 20-04, this happened just before COVID, which is why you might have forgotten about it. It uh, encouraged, or is it a mandate? I forget. Anyways, it asked Oregon to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. That's real progress. And where the teeth were, is that state agencies are authorized to prioritize reducing greenhouse gas emissions while helping vulnerable populations adapt to climate change. This is on the state level. The state of Oregon created a climate equity blueprint to help our agencies implement this. This is meaningful progress. Further, just in the last legislative session, we passed the 100% Clean Energy for All Act. This is pretty cool. This mandates zero greenhouse gas emissions from electricity generation by 2040. Again, that's 19 years down the line. We need it faster than that, but that's moving in the right direction. And significantly, there was a complementary bill that was passed with it that is designed to help low-income people pay for energy bills. So this is what we're doing. We're mitigating and we're adapting on a state level. This is good stuff. This is how Pacific Power is gonna get clean. All right. To summarize the cool things that are happening, lots of watershed restoration, habitat restoration, water conservation, more renewable energy. Let's do one more round of applause. Yeah, that feels good. Cool. Now we're gonna go into the, uh, the fun stuff. What could we be doing? I'm gonna throw out some ideas. You might not like them, 
I'm not saying they're the right ideas or the best ideas, but I am saying that they're things that we need to be open to thinking about and talking about and maybe even doing. So, let's start with a fun one. We need more dams. Remember, we're losing our snowpack. That snowpack is what supplies our streams and creeks in the summer. So we need more dams. Unfortunately, the traditional sort that humans build kind of suck. They destroy immense amounts of really valuable habitat. Uh, and it even turns out that they actually release on the, on the whole greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So I'm not talking about building more dams. Instead, I'm talking about letting beavers back onto the landscape and putting in more beaver dams. This is pretty cool. They do all sorts of great things. They expand the riparian area. Look at all this lush green. That's because we, we turned a creek into a pond. That water spread out and is watering all these plants for a much larger area. Also turns out they sequester carbon. Yeah. So look at these benefits. Better stream flow in the summer, less carbon. We don't have to pay any money to do it. That's pretty cool. Honestly, the biggest thing getting in the way right now is, and this is being honest, if you are a landowner, beavers are a pain in the butt. They will mess up all your carefully laid plans for how you want to manage your landscape. And we need to acknowledge that. They can be challenging to live with. And right now, Oregon state law allows you to kill nuisance beavers without even reporting it. So there's nothing to prevent somebody who's annoyed at the beaver that's just messed up their irrigation system from just shooting it or trapping it. What I want to suggest, if you are one of those folks who is challenged by your interactions with beavers, we've got a great organization called Beaver Works Oregon. They are experts at facilitating beaver-human conflict. They will find non-lethal solutions to help you manage your beaver problem. I'm serious about this, folks. This is important. <laughs> So there's another really cool thing about beavers. They're firefighters. Check this out. Before the big fire, there's a beaver pond with a healthy riparian area. After the big fire, the area has been scorched. Lots of the vegetation went up in flames and the beaver pond is still green. They keep that vegetation wet. Wet vegetation doesn't burn. This is a totally awesome scientist named Emily Fairfax who is researching this stuff. And according to her research, the average beaver pond during a mega fire, the worst of the worst, saves up around three acres of unburned green riparian vegetation. That's cool. We got a little uh, thing from Emily to show. She's also an amazing science communicator. Busy as a beaver. Yes, a couple laughs. <laughs> this is all a felt animation by hand. Very impressive. So look at that. There's our beaver pond. Here's all these new channels that the beaver is creating. This is our riparian vegetation expanding. This is awesome. This beaver's doing good work. Yeah, beaver. Oh no, a fire! Ah! Oh, look, the riparian area didn't burn. And look at the beaver. It's okay! <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty cool. As a reminder, if you're having beaver problems, talk to Beaver Works Oregon. Um, if you want to get involved and you don't have beaver problems, the Oregon Natural Desert Association is doing lots of watershed restoration to encourage beavers. Kind of a catch-22. They improve watershed restoration, but they need watersheds to be healthy in the first place. So you can call up ONDA, get involved in watershed restoration, plant some trees, dig some dirt, and help out beavers get on our landscape and do all sorts of cool things. All right, beavers, great, that's a fun one. Next up, let's talk about springs. Springs are actually really cool. I knew nothing about springs when I moved here, now I know a lot about them, it's been fun. Um, we've got something like 30,000 springs in Oregon. We're only monitoring, we only have long-term records for about 10 of them. Why does this matter? Because springs are the last refuge of every fish and frog and other thing that lives in a stream when the stream goes dry. Every summer we're getting warmer, drier streams. Those animals that need to survive the dry period till the winter rains come again, the springs give them a refuge. We call it a cold water refugia. So they're vitally important for our ecosystems and we have no clue what's going on with them. We don't know how they're being impacted by climate change, for example. So, students at Central Oregon Community College, 
Scientists with the USGS and the Nature Conservancy have collaborated to begin this amazing spring monitoring project. We've been doing it for a little over two years now. We're hitting up springs in the Ochicos and the Cascades. We're learning all about how they are being affected by climate change. This is a shameless plug. I teach this class. You can sign up for it. And I want to make this clear. This is citizen science. This is your opportunity to get involved, learning about how our ecosystems are responding to climate change. Shameless plug number two, sustainability at Central Oregon Community College. We've got all these classes that are designated as sustainability classes. We want our community to learn more about this. Currently, we even have a full-time sustainability coordinator. Unfortunately, their position is only funded for another six months. We could be doing a lot more at Central Oregon Community College with a full-time permanently funded sustainability coordinator and more buy-in from the administration. <laughs> I'm getting thumbs up in the back. Yes, great. Anyways, I've made my, my second shameless plug. More sustainability at COCC. Ask me more questions at the end. Let's keep moving. Uh, next one, this is, a, this is a challenging one. I mentioned that irrigation water is the primary use of water in Central Oregon. I'm gonna suggest that we need to rethink how we do it. As I mentioned, the laws that, uh, that, that govern how it is used are over 100 years old. The data that we use to allocate that water comes from 1983. Things have changed a little bit since then. That's the whole point of this talk. So I would suggest that we need a goal of equitable distribution of irrigation water to central Oregon farmers while ensuring sufficient stream flow for all users, the fish, the frog, the people. How can we do this? I've got to talk to a whole bunch of people who are experts in this field. They all had different ideas. They all had a lot to say. This is a complicated topic. I'm gonna to give a few suggestions. It is by no means comprehensive. Number one, we need to measure and monitor how this water is being used. Right now, less than 13% of the irrigation water has any sort of measuring or monitoring going on. In other words, we have no idea how much water a user is actually using. You can't manage something if you can't measure it. We need to encourage more conservation. Right now, a lot of farmers interpret the water law as saying that if they switch to a more efficient irrigation system, they actually lose their water rights because they're not, use, lose, they're, sorry, they're not using all of the available water. We need to change that and make it easy to switch to more uh, water conservation efficient sprinklers and irrigation systems. Basically, it's switching from flood irrigation to things like drip irrigation. Facilitating water banking. This is a way that the Central Oregon Irrigation District can transfer water to the North Unit Irrigation District with financial incentives. The, nature, or the Deschutes River Conservancy is starting to do this. We need more of this on the table. We need to make that easier. We need to manage for the future. I mentioned that right now the allocations are based off 1983 water data. We know the future is going to have significantly less water than we have today. We need to manage for that future, not 1983. And finally, the big picture. I really think we need to reform our water law. That's a big process. It's going to take a while. It's not impossible. California did it in 2015. So there is precedent there. All right. That's a complicated one. Those are things that I think would help. They're all informed by experts in the field who I've been chatting with. Let's move on. Let's talk about cooling our cities. Perhaps you've heard of the urban heat island effect. I'm about to show you a map of that for Ben, but to orient you, there's downtown, there's the Orchard District, Mountain View, here's us at COCC, here's the Deschutes River. The urban heat island effect is basically the idea that urban environments, which are built up with concrete, uh, absorb the heat from the sun and then re-radiate it out. Basically, it makes things hotter. You have all experienced this walking on blacktop on a hot summer day. So this is what we see in the city of Bend. The east side of town is significantly hotter than it would be otherwise. In some places, like Mountain View, we're seeing greater than three degrees Celsius, that's 10 degrees Fahrenheit, of additional heating because of the urban heat island effect. In contrast, parts of the west side of Bend are seeing significant cooling, which is great. That's, how, that's what we want. That's trees, good things like that. Um, but the point is we've got another equity issue here. 15 degree difference in the temperature makes things a lot harder for folks living over here. So what do we do about this? We need to figure out how to cool our cities. We're going to bring it back to the air conditioner in the tree story. 
I've already suggested why air conditioners are not a great option. They, they uh, put more carbon out into the atmosphere via the electricity that, gener that we use for them, and they actually heat things up around them. What we need is more things like this. So one way that we can do this, where all you come into play, is encouraging adoption of building codes that are designed for something called passive survivability. It's a weird word. Basically, it means if the power goes out, whether it's the middle of the winter during a snowstorm or the middle of the summer during a heat wave, how survivable is your home? So this starts with things like insulation, reflective roofs, a metal roof does a lot better than a black asphalt shingle roof during the summer. And by the way, it reduces carbon emissions. It's another plug there. Um, nighttime ventilation. This means opening our windows at night. We live in an amazing environment where it cools off every night, even during the worst heat waves. Uh, we can design homes that enhance this effect. And of course, tree shade. Having trees matters. All right, so I would advocate we do that. What all this leads us to is thinking about denser, greener cities. This might seem like a paradox. Denser means lots of concrete and not a lot of space for trees. Greener means more trees and more, urban air, more green urban areas. How do we do both? Well, it is possible. I'm gonna give an example here. This is Barcelona. It's a city of 1.7 million. It makes Bend look tiny. And they are famous for being a dense green city. To give you some examples here, big apartment buildings, lots of people densely packed together, big roads with big cars. That looks American. Um, but look at this, they've got this lovely park. There's trees. They've even interrupted the concrete with grass plantings to reduce the urban heat island effect. This is possible. And in many ways in Bend, we're in a good position for it. Bend Parks and Rec has done an amazing job of preserving lots of green space within the city. That is huge. We've got good resources for doing this. This also means encouraging different modes of transportation. So back up a moment. State of Oregon. Something like 38% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. For us to really put a dent in that, those dense green cities allow us to rely, allow us to favor bikes and pedestrians and non-car forms of transportation. So at a state level, this is being encouraged by something known as climate-friendly and equitable communities. The State Department of Land Conservation and Development, as a result of that executive order, has been tasked with creating these. There are eight of them in the state of Oregon. They're basically the eight largest urban areas. Bend is one of them. And what they're really focused on is creating climate-friendly areas. Downtown Bend is actually a great example. It is a place where people can work and live and play without getting into a car. This is what a dense green city looks like. We've already got elements of that. We've got a lot further to go. Um, and this is actually where, again, we can get involved. The adoption of these policies is unique to each city. So we can get involved influencing how the city council decides to implement uh, these climate friendly areas. All right, that's what's going on in the city of Bend. We need to think about carbon neutral electricity and how we can embrace that. Here's the problem. Wind and solar are great. They cannot be the primary source of electricity for our society. This gets into the nitty gritty of how electric grids work, but basically you need something called base load, something that is reliable, that can be turned up or down at the flick of a switch. Solar and wind rely on the sun shining and the wind blowing. So if you're trying to power your entire grid off of them, you actually need to build way, way, way more than is actually necessary so that when there's a heat wave, you have enough electricity. So point being right now, our base load is supplied by coal and natural gas. We need better alternatives than coal and natural gas. What's going on here? There is a geothermal development on the west flanks of Newberry Volcano outside of the monument boundaries. They're using something called an enhanced geothermal system. I'm happy to nerd out about that with you after the talk. Suffice it to say, it's not perfect. It uses up a lot of water, but it generates carbon neutral electricity. And that's important. Let's explore that idea a little further. Oh, taking a little bit of a left turn here, but trust me, it's getting somewhere. Let's talk about the safety of energy sources. We're going to play a fun game here. We're going to match the energy source to its depth print. Isn't that a fun term? Basically, how many people die for every million kilowatt hours of electricity that are produced? Oof. I'll start us off with the easy one. 
Coal, not only is it dirty, it's deadly. 100,000 people die just to produce that electricity. That's mostly essentially secondhand smoke. All the stuff that comes out of the smokestacks, there's particulate matter in it, just like with cigarettes, and that gets in our lungs and kills people through air quality problems. It also puts a ton of mercury into the environment. We can go on and on about why coal is terrible. I'm gonna shut up and let you guys take a look at this. Try to match up the energy source to the number of people who die for every million kilowatt hours. Let's see what we got here. So number two, natural gas, dirty and deadly. Number three, hydroelectric. That surprised me. It turns out that's mostly from a few really awful dam failures where like tens of thousands of people died. Um, fortunately, that hasn't happened in the US in a long time. Um, rooftop solar, surprisingly high up there. Wind, people are still falling off of wind turbines while they're doing maintenance. Look what's left. Yeah, how many people are surprised by that? Uh-huh. And how many people are kind of annoyed that I just put a green arrow on nuclear? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that more. So the fact is two things. One, nuclear energy is carbon neutral. And two, it is one of the safest forms of energy that we have. So let's start with that. It's safe and it's carbon neutral. There are still problems with nuclear energy. I worked for three years at Los Alamos National Laboratory monitoring radioactive contamination in the groundwater. We still don't know how to deal with nuclear waste. But here's the thing, this is where a geologist's perspective can be helpful. Nuclear waste is a problem on the order of thousands of years. We can safely put it away for 100 years, for 200 years. Climate change is a problem right now. Anything that we can do that reduces carbon in the atmosphere without compromising our environment too terribly, I would argue is worth doing. Again, we can argue this one. It is not a slam dunk. But from my perspective, nuclear is an incredibly efficient way to generate a ton of electricity in a way that's reasonably safe and actually better for the environment than a lot of us think. We'll talk more about that at the end. All righty. So one thing I want to show here, this is what a new nuclear plant looks like. It's a little different than the image you have in your head. This is actually a startup in Corvallis that's producing what they're calling modular nuclear plants. The whole idea is they don't need to be this huge, massive thing that takes up a ton of concrete, but instead it's something like the city of Bend could buy one of these and power the entire city with it. Wow. Right, small environmental footprint in terms of literally the, the amount of space it's taking up. Contrast that with solar, which can dwarf a desert, or wind, which also takes up a lot of space. All right, so I've made my picture nuclear. We can talk more about it later. Let's look at the big picture here. So right now, state of Oregon, climate emissions. Based on current policies, this is our projected carbon emissions for the state of Oregon. We're flatlining. We're not going anywhere close to meeting our targets of dropping down into the, whatever those percentage reduction were, uh, excuse me. Executive Order 20-04, this is the goals for that in 2035 and 2050. Point being, we're nowhere close. So the question is, how do we incentivize this? How do we get everybody doing it? All right, so back in 2019, the economists of the United States of America got together and said, uh, this is actually really simple. Every economist agrees, all you gotta do is make a carbon tax. I'll read directly, because these people are smarter than I am when it comes to this. A carbon tax offers the most cost-effective lever to reduce carbon emissions at the scale and speed that is necessary. Furthermore, look at the bottom one. To maximize the fairness and political viability of a rising carbon tax, all the revenue should be returned directly to U.S. citizens through equal lump sum rebates. The majority of American families, including the most vulnerable, will benefit financially by receiving more in carbon dividends than they pay in increased energy prices. This is mitigation and adaptation with an equity focus. This is coming from the most well-known economists in the United States. It's all the former heads of the Federal Reserve. It's Nobel laureates. It's all those folks. And they're all saying we need to put a price on carbon. To emphasize that point again, 3,623 U.S. economists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all saying we need to put a price on carbon. So I don't know how exposed you folks have been to that idea before. It's worth talking about. All right, we're almost done here. 
At the beginning of this presentation, I said we're going to look into whether summer 2021 is going to be normal. And the answer is yes, it will be. But the question is when? And this is again where we have that choice. If we can reduce carbon emissions, and I would suggest the most effective way of doing that is by putting a price on carbon, we push back 50 years. 2021 becomes normal by the end of the century, not the middle of the century. Either way, it's happening. It's a question of time. This is where, again, I think a geologist's perspective can be helpful. Well, you weren't expecting that. <laughs> this is what Oregon looked like somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years ago when humans first started walking around here. The shoreline extended tens of miles out. The, the Willamette Valley was repeatedly inundated by floodwaters from Glacial Lake Missoula. The Cascades were covered in an ice cap with enormous glaciers that went down towards Bend into the Skyliners Village today. Southeastern Oregon was a verdant paradise full of huge lakes with massive wetlands. And look what was walking around. We had Colombian mastodons and saber-toothed cats and giant ground sloths and humans who were thriving in this environment in a climate that was obviously way different than the climate we have today. And over those last 10,000 plus years, the climate changed. And it changed slowly and humans adapted. Humans thrived because we are adaptable, because the climate change was slow. That's the big point here. Humans are adaptable, but we need time. As I've been arguing all night long, we need it to be equitable as well so that everybody gets a chance to thrive as we move through the 21st century. I'm going to summarize our take home points here. On a personal level, be loud, be proud about your low-carbon lifestyle choices. On a community level, participate in adaptation actions. That could be watershed restoration, that could be attending city council meetings, that could be becoming a citizen scientist and signing up for my uh, spring monitoring class, hanging out with me and the Ochicos. It's a good time, I recommend it. And on a national and global level, I think we can agree we need to support carbon emissions reductions. How we do that is open for argument. I would advocate for nuclear energy and a carbon tax. I understand that many people will disagree with that. But bottom line, we need to support some sort of a serious reduction in carbon emissions. I want to end this talk the way we began it, listening to Tamara Calhoun, and I hope the audio is better this time. Years ago, I wasn't thinking about climate change, but now I understand that the heat waves and the cold snaps are real dangerous to my ancestral lands, to my elders, the keepers of knowledge, and the younger generation, which is the future. This climate change is not going to go away. We, the people, the community, the nation, need to stand up and fight for change. To repeat Tamara's words, this climate change is not going away. We, the people, need to stand up and fight for change. I'll end it on that. I'm a climate ambassador. That's the, that's the picture there. Alrighty, so I want to give a big thanks to all these folks. I'm not going to read them individually, but I want to make it clear this talk was a result of all these different people helping. It is now time for the questions and the answers and the comments. Let's dig into this. Let's have fun. We're going to alternate between the audience live and the audience on Zoom. Charlotte, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Hal, so much. We have quite a few questions coming through Zoom, and I think we're going to start with one of those and then grab one from the audience. Okay. From Dan, he asks, should we encourage no-till farming to prevent loss of soil and the dust bowl effect as shown in the slide during your presentation? That's a complicated one. Uh, No-till farming definitely reduces soil erosion. That's for sure. The challenge with no-till farming is that sometimes it leads to an increase in the need for pesticides. So there's a trade-off there. Um, so there's not an easy answer to that. Yes. So no-till farming, because we're losing less soil, does keep more carbon in the ground. So there's a lot of really good things about no-till farming. Like everything, there's a trade-off, and it probably depends on the individual farm and the individual conditions. Okay, do you want to go here? Okay, I'm 
We're not sharing microphones. Okay, fair so enough. Right. Take. So I've often heard and read that conservation is the cheapest form of carbon reduction. And yet it wasn't on the chart to show nuclear and gas and yeah, conservation is a great way to use le to emit less carbon into the atmosphere. Um, I think there's two reasons I didn't show it. One is that we've all heard it before. My goal tonight was not to um, shower us with things we've heard before. Um, and the other thing is it's not the same as producing more electricity, and we do need to produce more electricity. Um, we're, we are electrifying our grid, we're electrifying our automobiles. There's a huge need for more electricity, and it's not all going to come from wind and solar. Thank you. Okay, let's do another one from the audience. And I will, uh, you start and I will repeat it so everyone can hear on the live stream. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, regenerative farming, is that the name of that technique? That kind of encompasses all the other words like sustainable and organic. I mean, it's the whole thing. Yeah, okay. so I think what I would emphasize there is regenerative farming is a great example of how we can adapt. And I totally agree with you. Having more farmers get on board with that sort of policy has all sorts of benefits in terms of carbon reduction and better water usage and all the things we care about. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Anybody else from the audience? Yeah. Okay. Make sure it's a question. <laughs> okay. So another source of electricity is fuel cells. Fuel cells generating the hydrogen through electrolysis, which can come from the solar. Thoughts on that? Um, he asked about fuel cells generating fuel cells generate the, the, the electricity. The electricity. But you're going to have the hydrogen for the fuel cell. And you get the hydrogen from our solar, maybe wind too, and electrolysis gets you your hydrogen. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so getting your hydrogen from the solar. Did you hear that, Al? Yeah. Okay. Um, I honestly don't know much about fuel cell technology. Um, I'm not, I am not an energy expert. Uh, but I agree it's worth looking into and seeing if it's a good solution. Yeah. So safe and carbon neutral. Yeah. Cool. I would love to learn more about it. Thank you. Okay. From the Zoom, how would those mini nuclear plants hold up for a full rip of the CSZ? Thinking about Fukushima. Yeah. Great question. So interesting story there. The scientists who discovered that the Cascadia subduction zone, the CSZ, produces full rip earthquakes were doing it because we were trying to install a nuclear plant in southwest Washington in the 1980s. Um, and that plant did not go in, and I would argue that's a pretty reasonable reason to not put one in. I'm not saying we should put nuclear plants everywhere. There are good places to put them and bad places to put them, and near a large earthquake risk is not the best place to put them. That being said, I don't know enough about engineering to really definitively say, like, here in Bend, would this be safe? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Audience? In live audience? Okay, you can start. I'm trying to get my microphone a little closer to you, and then I'll repeat your question. Okay. Have you found any effective way to introduce climate change logic to people who don't believe in climate change? 
Good question. Has he, has Hal found any way to increase logic and introduce, introduce logic, logic on climate change to, to people who don't believe in climate change? I have two answers there. The first is a cop-out. I don't bother because I think it's a waste of time. Um, the better, more thoughtful answer, this, this comes from my colleagues in the USGS who are working in, in parts of the world where there is a lot of resistance to the idea of climate change. If you talk about the effects that people are experiencing, if you talk about drought, drought's something that everyone's experiencing. There's nothing to argue about there. So, one way of dealing with that is simply talking about, let's, let's talk about what's happening. There's a drought happening. What can we do about that? We can conserve water. So kind of skirting the issue and instead focusing on what we can all agree on. Um, yeah. Okay, up here in the front row. Most of the talk seems to be about uh, surface water. What studies do we have that measure the specificity of the aquifers here. Because as we get drier and drier, we're going to be pulling more and more from below. And no one talks about, everyone who knows nothing says this is going to last forever with nothing to cite. But until I think we have something tangible and, and, and something we can measure for, we have a stronger argument to you know, reinforce some of the other things you're saying. Yeah, yeah, so the um, question was, we talk a lot about groundwater, but what measurements do we have in place to actually measure aquifer water? How robust, water? realistically, is our aquifer? How robust, re realistically, is our aquifer? Yeah, uh, that's a long conversation. I'll try to give a decently succinct answer. Um, it is declining. We do have actually a lot of measurements of groundwater. Basically, every well, there, there are lots of monitoring wells in Central Oregon, and what they're showing is that the groundwater table is declining. We are losing our aquifer. Uh, that's primarily because as soon as people run out of water, whether that's the city of Bend or a farmer, we drill wells to pump it out of the ground. That's kind of like air conditioning. It's a really expensive solution that only works for some of us and negatively impacts everyone else. So yeah, we cannot, groundwater is not going to save us. That, that's the short of it there. <laughs> okay, back here, right here. Thank you for bringing up nuclear, uh, but my question is how much of an effort is really being made to install measuring and monitoring for water use, particularly in agricultural conditions? Yeah, there's a, oh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Okay. For everyone. Um, how much of an effort is being made to measure and monitor water usage for irrigation? Uh, that's actually got a lot of positive traction right now. Most of the irrigation districts are on board with it. Everyone agrees that, yeah, we need to know where the water is and where it's going and how it's being used. So I think that is realistically in the process of happening. Um, certainly needs support, but I think that is happening. Okay, we're going to go with Zoom. Um, can you talk about the reduction in local glaciers and local water supply? Example, Tumalo Creek. Any specific estimates? Um, the short story is that we're losing our glaciers rapidly and they are the source of a lot. That, where the glaciers really are important is the end of the summer when all the snowpack is gone and all the surface water is gone and our streams and creeks are drying up. The glaciers are the water of last resort. So in a situation like we're in right now where we had a really bad drought, streams are drying up that maybe in the past would still have been flowing if our glaciers were bigger. So I don't have a specific answer for Tumlo Creek, but that's the general situation. Glaciers are our water of last resort and we're losing them. Okay, I'll take another one from Zoom. Are the state, counties, and cities working on revising the building codes to mandate solar panels on all new buildings, residential and commercial? I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I do know is that as a result of Executive Order 20-04, everything's being revisited. So there will definitely be updates to building codes. What actually ends up on that is going to depend a lot on the input of citizens like yourselves. So that is again an opportunity to get involved, go to city council meetings, let people know what you think about building codes. Okay, thank you. There, I thought there was somebody around here, no? We'll go here. Go ahead. Um, 
So, uh, sort of ethical question. We've talked a lot about the equity issues involved in this and whether or not like minorities or economically challenged people get solar panels and other benefits from decarbonization. Is it unethical to waste the resources on folks in a first world nation with the highest standard of living in the world when the entire coastlines of people for hundreds of millions of people's livelihood and, and locations are at risk versus focusing on decarbonating as fast as possible with the resources that we have given the constraints of doing that? <laughs> Do you want to repeat that, Hal, or should I? Try? Let me see if I've got a handle on that. You're, you're, you're thinking about global equity versus Central Oregon equity, and pointing out that the first world is. Or just climate change getting the job done with, with constrained resources, political challenge. Yeah, um, there's no simple answers there. I don't have a great answer for you. Definitely, the more humanity reduces carbon emissions, the less screwed humanity is. Um, I don't know if that's a particularly satisfying answer. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one with the ethics and the equality. It's a good one. It's a good one. Up back here. So, uh, ah, and the fever. So the fever, if it gets on um, somebody's property and then builds it down and then they take it away, restitution, and do it somewhere else. So if there's beavers on the Deschutes River, it, does it become a political thing to take away from that beaver that's naturally building its home and everything in a nature area? Um, and how much does the drought and the fire uh, distinguish the beaver population? So the question was about the beavers and beavers building dams on public property and then about the wild, uh, the beavers benefit to wildfires. Yeah, I guess I'm not quite sure what the question is. My assumption is that on public lands, whoever the landowner is or the land manager would manage the beaver situation. And certainly most public land managers like the Forest Service at this point are encouraging beavers. That's, shows up in a lot of documents for management and adaptation. So I'm saying about city land and county land, if the creek goes in, nope, the neighbor doesn't own, the neighborhood doesn't own the creek, but the city maintains it or the county maintains it. So if there's a beaver building a dam there to slow down the water and to get more green growth like you described, it, does that turn into a political debate? I don't know. Does some of the beaver, uh, he, he's saying beavers, if beavers are building dams um, in like city land, even if it's through a neighborhood, but the city, the city or the county um, controls that creek or river, is, does it become a political issue with the benefits of beavers creating versus maybe what the neighborhood wants? The nuisance. The nuisance of the beaver. Yeah, you know, honestly, I'm really not sure. I, I would say reach out to Beaver Works Oregon. They're, they're going to give you a much better answer than I can because I'm truly not sure. But thank you for the question. And also, when does your course start? Uh, every term. The course Fall, winter, every spring, term. every term. It will be running for the next few decades. <laughs> January 3rd, his course starts. Thank you. Thank you. We've had a hand up over here for a while, the over lady here? in the middle. Okay. Go ahead. So I was wondering with beavers, as far as like protecting them and helping them just in the future, I think it'd be an interesting project to bring to my environmental club at school. So as far as how to go about protecting them, do you know anything about that? Or do you think I should contact the, the Fed or the Oregon Beaver Works? The question is, she would like to bring the beaver situation and benefits to her environmental club at school, and um, do you have information on the benefits? Or on how to, how to help. On how to help on that. Yeah, there's two main actions there. Number one is spreading awareness, which is exactly what I'm doing today, so that landowners who are dealing with beavers realize that there's non-lethal alternatives out there um, called Oregon Beaver Works. Um, and the other thing, if you want to get involved, is watershed restoration. So that's volunteering for groups like ONDA, the Oregon Natural Desert Association. Get on their website, see what sort of watershed restoration projects they've got going. Spend a day planting willows, and that will encourage more beaver habitat. 
So pretty tangible things you can do there. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, I knew there was one over here. Get my mic closer to you, thank you. I'm curious on the scale of things, where our um, cloud-based world uh, is leading us in terms of the energy that's pumped into these giant server farms that are popping up everywhere, and then the energy that has to get pushed into them to cool off those very same machines. Is there any, um, where does it fall on the scale of the trajectory of energy used for that sector, and is there any technology out there that maybe in the offing that is going to reduce that kind of heat generation for moving data back and forth? The question is about the, the, the cloud and these big businesses that we, data centers that we have here in Central Oregon and the amount of energy and heat they create and, and um, is, there any scale, is there any information on the scale of that amount of energy and heat, the heat that's brought out and what we're doing about it? Yeah, um, I don't have good specific answers for you there. I can offer you the general, like we need to figure out how to generate a lot more carbon neutral electricity. Um, I do know in the specific case of some of the data centers around Prineville, uh, those buildings are gold lead certified. They're built to that standard, which isn't the best lead certification standard, by the way. Platinum's the best. Um, that's a small step um, in making those buildings a little more energy efficient. Uh, but yeah, the, the bottom line is the cloud's not going anywhere. We need a lot more clean electricity coming online. We may have time for just one more. Oh, yeah. You, go ahead. Uh, so, low carbon concrete, can you explain more about uh, efficiencies in the manufacturing process? This is actually the product, and is that something CO6 can look into? So, explain the low carbon concrete is her question. Is that something, what's the process? Is that something COCC can look into? All right. So, the, the difference there is when we're actually making the cement. Uh, traditional methods involve heat, basically melting limestone, and that gives off a ton of CO2. So the more advanced methods, essentially, they use carbon dioxide to cure the cement. So basically, as the cement is drying, it's pulling in carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into its own bonds. The traditional way of doing it was with water, and now this method uses carbon dioxide to do that. I'm probably missing some of the details. I'm not an expert on that, but that's, that's part of how the cement itself uh, gives off less carbon in its creation. The challenge right now, the reason this has not been adopted globally in everything, is we haven't figured out how to do it in a ready mix uh, cement mixer. So we're really good at making concrete blocks with this low carbon cement, and that's great for paving things. Uh, what we haven't figured out how to do is have it on site in a cement mixer, and that's really the next big breakthrough to make this ubiquitous. Um, as far as what COCC can be doing with that, my guess is anytime we're thinking about repaving things, we could be contracting with Hooker Creek to use those low carbon blocks. But it, at this point, I don't think it's at building scale. Thanks for the question. Okay, we'll do one more from the live stream. Thank you, Hal, for sticking with us. Are there local demonstration examples of carbon farming similar to the Marin Carbon Project? Are you familiar with the Marin Carbon Project? Sorry. Something for us to Google. Yeah, um, I'm not aware, sorry. Okay, let's do one more then, there are just, there's millions. It's not clear if water users pay for their water. Is it free to farmers? Free or subsidized water provides no incentive to save water. Charging for water will quickly incentivize water users to save water and money. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll speak from personal experience. I used to be on the Central Oregon Irrigation District and I paid a flat fee every month and nobody monitored how much water I used or did not use. So absolutely, there is not direct incentive to conserve water from a price on the water. It's a flat fee. Okay, great. Right here? Okay. Can I just add something to that? Absolutely, you can add something. Uh, I'm in the Tumalo Irrigation District. My cost has gone up every year. Uh, 
from originally close to $300 a year to now about uh, $2,400 a year. And my water is monitored all the time. Could be daily. I never, but they monitor it to make sure. I'm allotted a certain amount of water, and I don't get any more than that, period. Yes. Sometimes I get less mm. for a lot of different reasons, but I never get more. So the, I'm repeating so the live stream can hear, just so you know. But she, this is coming from a farmer, and yes, her water use is monitored. Her bill, she's in the Tumalo Irrigation District. Your bill has gone anywhere from like 300 to 2400, you said? And she can't use a drop more than the amount of water she's allocated. So maybe some things have changed, it sounds like. I think it really depends on the irrigation district. Okay. So. That situation doesn't sound great for you, but that is, I think, the direction that we need to be going in, where there is more accountability for how much water gets used. I might add that the irrigation districts, at least mine, and I know that there's a, you know, like every business, there's, they have, you know, they meet together, the different irrigation districts, but ever since I've been doing it for 35 years, um, they're always offering incentives to make sure your nozzles haven't, you know, gotten too big because of debris going through them and there's been uh, some help for, uh, and, uh, to help offset the cost for changing your irrigation system to something more uh, efficient. So, at least in my irrigation district and I think in others, that goes on a lot. It doesn't happen every year, but it does happen frequently. Unfortunately, I've done it always the year before they offer. <laughs> so just another addition there, the irrigation districts are meeting and collaborating, but in her irrigation district, there are incentives to make sure everything's running properly, nozzles aren't letting out too much water, that kind of thing. So there are the irrigation, some irrigation districts are offering incentives for things that could conserve water. Awesome. So, yeah, that's really encouraging to hear. Um, are we at wrapping that point, Sharon? We are wrapped up. We could go on and on now. You're a wealth of knowledge and entertaining to do. Thank you. All righty. Thank yeah, you, folks. So thank you, Hal, and thank you all for coming, and we'll keep the conversation going.